I've been very lucky. Uh, part of this Rolling World premiere from the National New Play Network first premiered at the only theater center outside of Washington, D.C., and then it went to Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis, and now here it's at the Dallas Theater Center, and I've been, been able to be a part of, at least part of the rehearsal process for each of the productions, so that's been uh, incredible. You know, one of the benefits of the Rolling World premiere is that you get to continually refine and revise the play. It's sort of like an ongoing laboratory in the best possible way. There's all the pressures of opening, there's all the pressures of wanting to put the best possible play up, but it takes away the idea of, I have to get this right. I have to create a definitive production, which I've never really believed in anyway. I believe the definitive production is the production that's right for this community and this moment in time. So what happens when you take a play into a community, into a theater that's different is the responses change. It's one of the great treats for a playwright because they get to sort of actor-proof, audience-proof, community-proof their play if they want to. We've had writers who totally change the end of the play. We've had writers who cut a character. The program began as a way of being able to share the work our member theaters were doing in their own communities with the country at large. We were finding that many of our theaters had great writers uh, in their own hometowns that they'd been working with. And the world premieres were happening, but then not a second or a third production. So we wanted to be able to both share the work of the writers we were all in love with, and to be able to share the plays that were being produced by our member theaters with a larger community across the country. When Andrew first came to Dallas, that very first time when I met him and I had just read his play, he walked into the theater space and I said, this space, this is the perfect space for your play. And I still believe that that's true. Colossal is at the center of the type of work that we do here at Dallas Theater Center. It's a new play, we do a lot of new work. It speaks to immediate contemporary themes that are relevant in our community today. It does so in a boldly theatrical language with aggressive physical sequences and loud music and theatrical surprises. The very first thing that I loved about the play, the second that I read it, is the size and scope of its ambition. So for instance, the piece demands a complete original modern dance at halftime. So that means you gotta go out and find a modern dance choreographer. In our case, that's Josh Pugh, an outstanding modern dance choreographer who doesn't choreograph musicals or plays, he works exclusively in dance. And then the leaning off the balance, shifting that way. Yeah, don't let it, don't let it come up too high. It's a bit too high in the body. Feel that your head keeps going that slowly. direction. That's better, yeah. So the the cast for Colossal is very diverse. We have real football players, we have professional dancers, and we have actors. And they all participate in the middle section of the play, which is um, a sort of concert dance performance. When I'm working, when I'm choreographing, I'm always looking for things to be authentic and to be truthful. And so taking from the dancers, from the actors, from the football players, choices that are instinctual and building that direction instead of trying to make them fit into what my idea of what it should look like is. He builds a movement vocabulary very organically based on what he sees uh, his dancers doing the vocabulary for this particular piece because it greets modern dance into a play that's a kind of about a person who is a football player but who is also a modern dancer. Okay, let me know who else is down there. Lots of people don't know exactly what a stage manager is. I'm kind of the puppet master of the whole show. I make 
the technical things happen. I tell other people to push a button, which is how the lights or the sound cue happens. I am in charge of all the communication from pre-rehearsal period to the end of the show, making sure everyone's on the same page and communicating clearly and openly. I contacted uh, the stage manager from the Olney Theater Center, which was the first place this premiered this season, and kind of asked just a few initial questions about her experience on the show, if there was anything she thought maybe I needed to know. Does that make sense? Yep. It does. Uh, can we just look at that that beat? Uh, Joel, can we just do your exit? Uh, a couple lines back, negative to exit from the... I would say that we have made some definite changes from the script that was used in the last two places, mainly around the fact that we have a quadriplegic actor instead of a paraplegic actor playing the role of Mike. So we've changed some things in the script and some movements in the show to kind of better reflect the needs of our specific actor playing Mike. That's been one of the unique challenges of this show. Of course, I have direct parallels between what happens in this story and what happened to me. Of course, he suffers a spinal cord injury, I had a spinal cord injury, in my neck, in his neck, same thing. You're almost there, Mike, you're almost there. You're doing great, just a few more inches. <sighs> Jesus, stop! Okay, please stop! Okay, I got, I got you. you. We're sitting no, down. I'm preparing okay. for this like any actor really prepares for a role. You have experiences from your own life that you can relate directly. You have things that you have to make up and imagine through um, because that's what this creative process is. Um, it's just it's great to be doing the work. No fuel of action now. It's okay. It won't hurt you. It has been a quite an interesting journey with all of the testosterone that is in the room all of the time. The testosterone is large and in charge, and I have to somehow manage the testosterone and the boys and keep them as calm as I can. There are some hot heads at times and some wrestling around and kind of pushing each other. I often have to step in and calm things down. It's always interesting figuring out how to be their boss, gain their respect, and still be their friend and a person they can talk to. I have never been around so much testosterone and so much alpha male aggression and attitude in my entire life. I'm a theater geek. This is really intense for me. <laughs> Ain't no rest for the wicked. Money don't grow on trees. In this cast, we also have uh, like legitimate NFL prospects to have that expertise in the room every day to say, hey, we want to make sure these drills are right. We want to make sure these moments where the play is um, asking to be very literal in how it represents football, that we do that not only correctly, but that because we have these bodies in the room, we can embody the ferocity of football, the grandeur of football, the size of it. In a way, what Andrew's done is taken that reality and made it very hyper-theatrical. When you see a real football player out there and you're seeing a, an actor who has no choice but to be in a chair, and you see those amazing dancers that we've had in a few of the cast, it starts to break the line between what is acting or what is theater and what's really happening in these people's lives. Football is a different form of theater. You're, you come to an arena to, to watch a game, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. They're primed to be actors because they have been performing in that theater. Let's go. Marcus is the lover of young Mike. He's also a team captain on the football team that Mike is on and uh, he's struggling with his identity as a homosexual man while being in a very masculine driven testosterone ridden world uh, like the football world. Hey! Yeah! One more set. Uh, I'm, not I'm not even helping. Yeah! I'm not helping. This is all you. It's very, very true about the way that men dialogue with each other, especially in, in emotional ways. 
we're not taught to outwardly emote. We're not taught that it's okay to do that. One of the themes in the play it touches on homosexuality. It's a big theme in the show, and you know it's important that this is being talked about. That it runs through this play, especially in a play that is so male-driven, testosterone aggression-driven. Anyone's not there. They're gonna say exactly what we told them: that we're captains of this team, and that captains can't get caught at a strip club. And no one's gonna notice we're sharing a room. That's what teammates do. This is a conversation about homosexuality, about how free we can be to express that within ourselves in our society. It's a conversation that's happening nationally. One of my favorite lines in the show, and it's not mine, is that these things are changing, but changing ain't changed. The play sets up for us a really deep and profound question about do we choose to live in a past that can no longer exist or do we choose to look honestly at what has been and choose how to move forward into an unknown? I can't, I can't, I can't feel my fucking legs. It's all right, it's okay. I can't feel my fucking legs. There are a lot of uh, coming of age kind of themes, becoming a man, what it means to stand up to your father. I think that in any young man's relationship, there, there's always a, a, a bit of a struggle of trying to, um, I don't know, break out of your, your, your father's idea of who you should be and become yourself. Michael Schultz, where have you been? Jesus, scream a little louder. Where were you this afternoon? My father wanted me to play football. He wanted me to go to university to play football, but I didn't want to. I wanted to do, be in theater. So I had to follow my dream, and me and my parents didn't talk for a long time about, you know, my goals, my aspirations, and other things. It was kind of that elephant in the room. And just recently, they've accepted the fact that I made a wise choice and that I'm happy and, and that, that I'm doing what I love to do. And when I saw that in the script, I wanted to be a part of that story. What you get with this Rolling World premiere is, it's not only do you get a chance to sort of figure out, oh, I got, a, I got that scene wrong, now I'm gonna try to get it right in this production, which has happened certainly as well, but also you get a sense of what is the elasticity of the play. How, how much can it be flexible to suit the specific um, needs a, a, of the room? And that's really exciting because that's just a, a core belief of mine as a theater artist that it shouldn't just be the same production that's planted into a different city because uh, that doesn't engage with the liveness of the form. You know, every play was new at some point, and every play is new for any audience that sees it for the first time. But what happens with new work and the work that we're supporting is that Playwrights are responding to the issues of our times. Even if it's not a dramatic play or a play about a specific issue, they're being able to respond to what's happening in their lives now. I once famously said in a meeting, oh, you, we don't have to worry about how much money we raise for this program. We'll never get three artistic directors to agree to anything. Uh, and now here we are. It's changed how we do theater, how we share theater, how plays move across this country, and more and more around the world. Thank you.